Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this module of the AI in Medicine course. My name is Ernest, and today we're going to talk about evolution of AI branches and main players. As we mentioned in the um, discussion in the class, um, AI and machine learning are not new terms. They've been around for decades. If you search in the IEEE Explorer um, using the artificial intelligence keyword, you will go back to 1910. But um, I think uh, what we are observing today is one of the most exciting part of the AI history. Uh, well, we can say it started with um, Perceptron. Um, so Perceptron is considered to be the ancestor of the neural networks and neural networks are um, almost always at the core of all those cool machine learning algorithms and models. Um, the idea is simple. They're uh, linear classifiers. And um, if the setting is um, defined correctly, there is a very efficient way for uh, implementing a perceptron. Um, we briefly mentioned in the class that input to the models um, in, in machine learning um, is features. And to show features, we use the X notation. Usually it is, uh, it is uh, shown using the capital X. Theta in this case is the uh, separating line we're trying to learn and generally uh, refers to the whole set of learnable parameters you have. And then Y is uh, the ground truth label. In this case, which is classification, which is binary, it is very important to define your Y as positive one and negative one because that then will help you to implement your algorithm, your algorithm efficiently. And uh, because we do have access to Y, at least during the training, uh, this is called supervised learning. Uh, a couple of more points. Uh, we have um, subscripts. So X uh, sub one and two, are two different features. Sometimes they're called dimensions. Um, and superscript refers to specific examples. So here we have two data points, two examples. One is the uh, blue circle. The other one is the red circle. And uh, to show them, we use um, superscript. The whole idea of training a perceptron is based on inner product. And if uh, you find the optimal line, then uh, you, you can see that based on inner product, uh, this equation, y multiplied by inner product of theta uh, and x is gonna be always positive. So if this is met, you have found uh, a perfect line. We don't want to get uh, to um, all the details we have here. Uh, but another important thing is to know that uh, we usually start from a random state and then we iterate over examples, either a couple of examples at a time or one example at a time, and then continue updating uh, the learnable parameters until we find the optimum line. Uh, we are talking about uh, 1950s and 60s. So this specific um, paper is particularly interesting uh, because it proves mathematically that uh, for perceptrons, if you normalize your data, uh, you will need less iterations until you get to the optimal state. And although this is from 1962, the idea still applies. 
And I believe back then, uh, people were so great at math, something that we need to do. Let's uh, see an example of the perceptron in action. In the 1950s and 60s, scientists built a few working perceptrons, as these artificial brains were called. He's using it to explore the mysterious problem of how the brain learns. This perceptron is being trained to recognize the difference between males and females. It is something that all of us can do easily, but few of us can explain how. To get a computer to do this would involve working out many complex rules about faces and writing a computer program. But this perceptron was simply given lots and lots of examples, including some with unusual hairstyles. But when it comes to a beetle, the computer looks at facial features of hair outline and takes longer to learn what it's told by Dr. Taylor. Andrew Cookchamp's wig also caught it a little heart searching. After training on lots of examples, it's given new faces it has never seen and is able to successfully distinguish male from female. It has learned. While promising, this approach to machine intelligence virtually died out. All right. Uh, so you may say uh, I'm fine with learning history, but at least make it contemporary. And that's fine. So um, let's um, talk about NeurIPS a little bit, uh, which is considered to be one of the most important or the most important uh, conference in, in the field of AI. Unfortunately, I could not find the uh, mostly updated uh, stats, but if you uh, look at the total accepted papers by year, you will see the explode um, in um, being interested in AI over the years. And um, and that's interesting uh, to, to notice um, how much focus in AI is um, on conferences. Um, in, in other fields, usually uh, the number one target for, for the uh, papers and research is high impact journals. But in AI, I'm not saying it's not that at all, but um, the priority for research, for publishing your research uh, is well-known conferences. And there are many, uh, New Rips is one of them. Um, New Rips was called NIPS until 2017. It has um, a story behind it. You can Google and see why it was renamed. Um, but, um, if you want to have access to previously published papers, um, I guess uh, nips.cc is the website um, still to, the, to this day. Uh, another um, observation to see what is happening um, is the citations for uh, Sir Jeffrey Hinton. First of all, if you uh, look at his number of citations, it's insane. Um, he is one of the uh, most cited uh, researchers in the world for sure. Of course, there are other people in other fields uh, that have even more than this, uh, but this is super interesting. Um, and it, it uh, changes daily. So chances are, if you uh, look at the number right now, you will see um, a, a higher number. Another interesting point on his um, Google Scholar profile is um, the top um, cited uh, papers and projects by him. Of course, um, ImageNet classification with deep neural convolutional neural networks uh, by Alex um, is, is number one. Number two is the deep learning, the book uh, they wrote uh, with um, Dr. Benjo and Dr. Lapoon. Um, it's interesting to see uh, all those big names 
the, the major players um, of AI in academia collaborated on, on a project together and it was quite successful. But something that is, um, in my opinion, even more important than that is um, this trend here. Um, if you um, track the, 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 his number of citations over years, you will see it's getting plateaued. And uh, that's something to, to be noticed, maybe. Uh, we are exiting uh, at least that high fever of, of AI. Um, but how much has it been attractive outside academia? That's another element of um, um, in any field and any factor that uh, be becomes hot. You should see how it works in academia and then outside of it. And um, just in Toronto, um, until March 16th, if they have not missed any uh, minor startup, there were uh, 567 startups. And some of them are quite promising. Deep Genomics is uh, one of the best ones. Um, and Cohere, of course, uh, is trying to compete with OpenAI. So uh, these guys are all well-funded. They have uh, absorbed a, a lot of talented people. They have cool ideas and they're very active. Again, uh, one important thing on this slide is to notice um, the day they started. Uh, I think the golden time you could start um, your startup uh, was that um, that uh, those years, like, uh, 2014, 15, 16, all the way to 19. Uh, that, that was a very good time for that. Now the competition is uh, insane. I'm not saying it's not possible to enter this area anymore, but uh, it's not as easy as it was. Now we can uh, talk about the AI evolution. Of course, this is my personal point of view. You may disagree on some parts. The other thing is that the dates are rough. Sometimes they um, overlap, but um, I guess overall, this should uh, give you a very good idea. So uh, the first part is before uh, 2009, that you could see uh, tree-based algorithms and um, linear models. Of course, researchers are still exploring these algorithms. I'm not trying to say if, if you're using random forest, uh, you are obsolete, no. Uh, but the most important thing is that the algorithms were simpler. There was no cohesion and a specific focus on, on something. And uh, even something like image segmentation was done using random forest. Today, it is so odd. When you say image segmentation using some sort of AI, it is 99% units, but back then they were using random forest for it. And then um, classic image and uh, language analysis, frequency based language analysis, and then uh, image processing algorithm, the, the conventional ones uh, were, were dominating. And uh, for games, it was always uh, trying to utilize some sort of big memory. So memorize all the possible moves in chess, for example, and then uh, choose the best that will over move over the next 16 move, for example, uh, gives you the best result. That, that was the way before that. 
And then we get into um, the era of computer vision, maybe roughly uh, 2009 to 2017. Um, it's, I, I think the thing that um, triggered everything was ImageNet, uh, the competition. And um, of course, in 2012, um, AlexNet was introduced. Um, you, you saw the paper. It was the uh, rank one paper of um, Sir Hinton. And uh, they, for the first time, introduced uh, a very successful convolutional neural. Um, it was amazing. Of course, the, the ideas were already there, but that was the first time um, a model really worked. They, they could win the competition. And then in uh, 2010, uh, Kegel was uh, launched. So the idea that in, instead of giving money to people and asking them to do something, create a competition and the winners will get the money. Um, that, that is amazing. I, overall, I, I love that approach and it really worked. Um, Many different kegelers were introduced uh, to the world, um, and then they created a very good system to um, promote those who were the best players. Anyways, uh, DeepMind uh, was founded then, and then Google acquires DeepMind in 2014. So those are the most important things happening in that era and that it is the time for computer vision. Then we have um, 2018 to 2021. Again, there is overlap. There is no, um, no distinct border between these eras, but roughly 2018 to 2021, reinforcement learning um, is the focus. And um, you can see the momentum was formed in 2014 um, by those who worked uh, to beat humans using AI in different games. But now they're talking about self-driving cars and superhuman models for different games. And of course, the most important thing was and is still drug discovery and genomics. Then we get to NLP, which is the current time. So eventually you have industry taking over everything, um, including research. And uh, finally you're um, having promising and leading young companies in this field. Examples are OpenAI, you know, Hugging Face, Cohere, all these uh, companies are amazing. They're doing a great job and um, we are enjoying their models. 2024 and after, um, nobody knows. It's just um, my guess and uh, many, many people would uh, have the same idea that we're not sure, but domain knowledge uh, is becoming more and more important. Well, is there a Cisco in AI? Um, some of you may uh, not know what Cisco is. Cisco is a company. And um, in many cases, computer networking means Cisco. So a huge, huge amount of um, internet data is passing over Cisco routers. And that is a one of a kind company. It has no competitors. Of course it has, but none of them are even close to Cisco. And uh, you can say somehow Cisco is um, in a safe zone. Uh, is there something like that in AI? And the answer is yes, it's, it's gonna be NVIDIA. It is NVIDIA. So 
AI hardware, as you know, um, the, the most important part is GPU rather than CPU. And that specific type of GPU, which is customized for AI applications, um, comes from NVIDIA and only from NVIDIA. We, we do have other companies. There is, for example, AMD in gaming. Yeah, sometimes uh, you, can, you can use um, AMD GPUs. Uh, for AI, they have tried to do something like that. But as soon as you, you want to become really professional and serious about the research, about production, whatever in AI, it's for sure NVIDIA. Uh, biggest moves of the biggest entities, and again, uh, it's my opinion, maybe uh, you Google, you go on YouTube, you find something else, uh, but I think it's reasonable, and I've um, discussed this with uh, multiple friends, they, they were all agreed. Um, so Microsoft, Facebook, now called Meta, and Google, um, we can call them the biggest uh, companies active in, in AI. So game changers are going to be these three. Now, uh, for Microsoft in 2018, they acquired GitHub. It was a very uh, big move, in my opinion. Uh, suddenly, they got access to all the public and maybe private uh, coding repositories in all the languages, that's insane. 2019, they invested uh, almost 1 billion in OpenAI, and now OpenAI is for profit, for profit. So uh, whatever they have, Microsoft is able to use, uh, and you can see um, already they have integrated, integrated some models into uh, their Bing uh, search engine and their Edge uh, browser. And then 2020 partnership with OpenAI, of course. For Meta in uh, 2013, they um, hired uh, Yan De Kroon. It was amazing. Uh, and it has been amazing. I personally think uh, Lacoon is the uh, among those uh, top players in academia research. Lacoon is uh, is unique. is uh, very open to advancing AI and uh, very out of the box always always. And in 2016, um, we had the first release of PyTorch. PyTorch is um, now, it was one of the most important framework for developing AR algorithms. Now it is the most important one. And then uh, for Google, of course, um, in 2011, they, uh, they started Google Brain and then um, Jeffrey Hinton joined Google, and then they acquired uh, DeepMind 2017, and uh, TensorFlow, the other, um, the other option you have uh, rather than PyTorch was first released. And then uh, 2017, they acquired Kaggle. It was a very big move um, that allowed them uh, to uh, hire very talented people. And then uh, same year, uh, they released Google Colab. It's amazing. They addressed a very important issue, uh, which is when you want to use Python and, and you start coding um, machine learning models, it's always a big headache to get everything installed and working. Google Colab is uh, a cloud-based solution. Uh, allowing you to jumpstart and uh, do your coding. Now it is even better. They, they have augmented it with uh, BART that uh, helps you to develop your codes. 
semi-automatically or automatically. Um, it's it's amazing. So Google for sure um, has done more than any other company um, in in this field, and all not all moves, but most of them uh, have been really moved. Um, a very important point, in my opinion, is that a game changer in pure AI research nowadays is um, harder than before. And the reason is, if you compare just the computational resources we have, um, it's ridiculous. It's, uh, for example, um, you can see OpenAI has 10,000 GPUs, whereas SIGKIT has just eight GPU nodes. So th this, this, is, um, this is ridiculously different. And because of that, you cannot train any model you want. Um, at SIGKIT, you may have to wait for something like a week until you get the turn to run your model. And eventually it, it has to be a very small model, a very simple model. So uh, you are limited in, in academia. And uh, that's why, um, and that's how uh, industry is taking over or has taken over. You may say, but I'm still interested in research and academia, and that's my talk. Um, so leading AI-oriented Canadian research institutes, it's important to know them. It helps you to find internship positions, some jobs, being um, in contact with them, follow their um, faculty members, their research. They, they, they are still very good compared to um, other uh, research groups um, in, in the world. So of course, uh, Victor Institute in Toronto, uh, Mila in Montreal, and Amy in um, Alberta, uh, they're the leading groups. And um, each of them uh, has one big name behind the scene. But nowadays they have uh, multiple faculty members and many sharp students. Their research is still good. Um, and because they are connected to those um, pioneering companies, in terms of uh, computational resources, they are still better than pure academia. Finally, uh, I guess the most important question everyone can ask is about future. And uh, Napoleon says, uh, the stupid speak of the past, the wise of the present, and fools of the future. But I would say, don't give me catchy codes, just say I don't. So that's, that's the conclusion. We don't know what is happening. I briefly mentioned uh, for sure it will be more focused on the domain knowledge. Thank you.